our topic today, Higo Koshirai. And uh, let's start right in. So what constitutes a Higo Koshirai? And it's a little bit difficult because it's actually not a very clear definition. It has, it has to have A, B, C, D. It's not like this, but it is. It has certain parameters that makes a, Higo, a Koshirai a Higo Koshirai. So I try to nail it down to one paragraph what constitutes a Higo Koshirai. So it's a Koshirai that is mounted with fittings made by Higo based artists and that follows overall stylistic elements seen with archetypes made to the liking of Hosokawa Sansai Tadaoki. So it's a very wordy phrase, but that's what we can say that makes a Higo Koshirai. So uh, it more or less goes back to him, Hosokawa Tadaoki, who was the daimyo of the Kumamoto fief in Higo province. This is when he was in the prime of his life. He had enjoyed a very long life, as you can see here, 83 years old. Uh, and that's him later when he has shaved his head and entered priesthood under the name Sansai. So how do we get there? How do we get to Higo Koshirai at all? First of all, uh, Sengoku period was one defining element. The second defining element was the tea culture. And the third defining element we already mentioned, the person Hosokawa Tadaoki. All these three has to come together to give birth to the Higo Koshirai. So what about, how about Sen Sengoku period? I mean, we all know there's a lot of battles, a lot of things changed during a uh, 40 warrior class. There was a lot, lot of uncertainty. So all uh, elements that worked before in terms of Buddhism, uh, it changed a little bit. There was uh, more and more a focus on Zen Buddhism. It was uh, all about uh, life and death and the contemplation of all, all the, the concept. And there was also this change also spilled over into the, the tea world that I've just addressed earlier. So before the Muromachi period, the later Muromachi period, uh, the tea ceremony was not what we would think today of sitting in a small room with a little tea bowl. There were big uh, like banquets, big festivals, there was a big party, there was catering, uh, there were games were played, there was the, 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 the tea, uh, tea get-togethers of the Nambokcho and the early Muromachi with the Chicago shoguns. There was even like some side, some little side events of like bonsai viewing. But it all changed later into what we know now today, where it has a separate tea room, it's separated from the, from the main house of the samurai. But the thought behind was this very same we had in Europe. In Europe we had salons, we had fancy dinners, and there were certain topics that were not appropriate at the dinner, dinner table. So after, after uh, uh, a dinner was over, the men, usually the men, were just uh, going into a separate room, a study room, a smoking room, where, where you can discuss different topics. Like in Europe, you don't discuss uh, politics, business at the dinner table. When everyone is here, your spouse says, you go to the separate smoking room where, where you discuss those things. In Japan, it was the other way around. If you go to the tea room, you were not supposed to talk about politics or business. It was, you talk more about the arts, and the, the higher uh, things. So, and who was very important for this? The tea masters. The tea masters were telling the samurai quasi what you had to do, how, how to like furnish a tea room and what the, what the procedures were. So here we have Sen no Rikyu, the most famous one of all. You probably all have heard of him. And he was the teacher of Hosokawa Tadaoki about the tea ceremony. So he Taught. I mean, Hosokawa Tadaoki was, very, was already a very refined man of the arts, but the last little refinish, refinishment of the tea taste he got from uh, Sen Norikyu. And Sen Norikyu had seven major students and Hosokawa Tadaoki was one of them. And what is very important for the tea of the time period, you all have heard it too, it's Wabi Sabi, the entire libraries have been, have been written on this topic, so I just want to keep it short. Uh, what is actually, what is the aesthetic concept of wabi-sabi? It's an, an object that has some uh, unobtrusive, simple and rustic that makes you aware of like the impermanence and imperfection of life. 
So Wabi Sabi is not uh, ostentatious, it's not flamboyant. And this can be both things. It can be natural, it can be an object that has Wabi Sabi because of its age or of its humble background. Like in the early tea ceremony, the tea masters were using tea bowls, old tea bowls from Korea or China. And like if you would today, you would not pick a Starbucks cup, but that's the, the you get the idea. Some just an ordinary object you elevate because of its simplicity to use for the tea ceremony. But it can also be deliberate. It can be an object made in the style to resemble Wabi Sabi. And this is the the background of the Hibu Koshira and Hibu fittings. Because no fitting and no tsuba is growing on the tree, you have to make them. This is one of the uh, typical uh, black tea bowls of the time period that has, is always described as if, like the, the perfect symbol of Wabi Sabi. It's very simple. It's a Momoyama period tea bowl. I think it's in the Tokyo National Museum. Uh, just to get an idea when we talk later about the Hibu Koshira. So Jose Kawatada, okay, he was not only into Koshira, of course, he was also designing or telling his armorers what kind of style the armor he wants to wear. As you can see here again, very simple, very black and, and, and unobtrusive color tones. And also there was a huge collection in the Hosokawa, of course, about, about the, the proper tea utensils. A uh, large collection is all now, or most of it is now in the Eisei Bunko in, in Tokyo that has the Hosokawa collection in there. And this brings us to the time when all this took place, end of Sengoku period Momoyama. So there were two trends. There was the super flamboyant trend, like Oda Nobunaga, the <coughs> time you wanted to show off their flamboyant taste like this. You have like a gold lacquered same scabbard or even like sheet metal uh, representing same those style. Or this style that was the, the Daisho word by Toyotomi Hideyoshi. It's very loud, you have this gold wrapping around the hip, the scabbards, red scabbards, but there was also a counter trend. The counter trend was called the Tensho Koshirai, named after the era, 1573 to 1592. So certain time you already were going the other way, they're gonna go to a simple taste, the tea taste, very practically orientated, they all came out of the Sengoku period, they were ready for battle, they wanted something functional, simple, like a leather wrapping, that's uh, more uh, sturdy than a uh, silk wrapping, uh, and so on. And this is, so to speak, the birthplace of the Higu Koshira, came out of the Tenshu Koshira. And a lot of famous daimyo were wearing this. This was not uh, considered as cheap, like the Uesugi Kenshin, Tokugawa Ieyasu, they were wearing, wearing swords in, in this Tenshu Koshira style. And now we come to the archetype of Higu Koshira. We have one over here, it's the same style. <laughs> So these are two famous Higo uh, mounts that were worn by Hosokawa Tadaoki and made to his liking. On top you see the Kasen Koshirai. It's named after uh, an incident. It's de historically debuted because it's not in the, in the chronicles, in the biography of, of Hosokawa Tadaoki. It is said that one day he was executing 36 criminals with the blade in this, in this uh, mount and because 36 reminded him of the 36 famous poets, the Kasen, Sanjuro Kasen, and that's why I call it the Kasen Koshirai. And the other blade uh, is called the Nobunaga Koshirai. It has nothing to do with Oda Nobunaga. It's just the blade in there. It's made by a, a northern, rather obscure smith with the name Nobunaga. And I just wanted to show you the blades here too, because it's important to understand these early archetypes of Higu Koshirai. The Kasen Koshirai has an uh, a Nosada play, an early work. I've seen it once uh, on display. It's actually not very, uh, it's, it's not very striking, it's very humble. And also, and that's a Nobunaga blade. It's also a late Muromachi uh, Northern blade. But it's, as you can see already, it's the Katate Uchi, what you can wear, uh, wield with one hand. Short Nagasa and a very short tang. That's why these early Higo uh, mountings, they have a, a rather short hilt. So even Hosokawa Tadaoki, he, can get up, he could afford any blade he wanted, but he wanted a, just a functional, working, battlefield-proof blade that he was wearing in his fancy mounts. So next I'm going to uh, describe what the, element, the individual elements of the Higo Koshirai. As you can see here, uh, 
often has a black lacquered same and then it's wrapped in leather which is very functional but also very very unobtrusive from the color scheme so we're gonna go back to the wabi and sabi aesthetics it's usually an iron suba this one is a, a shiwami piece but was later copied by, by the higo artists too and the, this is the one for the kasen koshirai and that's the one for the nobunaga koshirai you can see here same concept black same leather wrapping on hilt and there's also a tsuba that was later copied by local Higo artists, which are going to show later too. And also, uh, very typical for Higo is a certain style of Fuchi Kashira. As you can see here, you can see here it is very low. The Fuchi is very narrow and the Kashira also very narrow. There are some more types I'm going to show in a minute, but that's a very typical Higo Fuchi. A low, a low Fuchi and a low Kashira. Uh, so Ito Mitsuru in his book, he points out different typical Higo Fuji styles. They have some with one groove, uh, just a little suggested groove in the middle, but all of them are very narrow, very low. So that's a typical Higo Fuji. The same goes, there's some archetype of, of Higo Kashira. So you have the low ones, you have the one that has the, the, the big holes for lacing the cord through. You have some that look like waves. Uh, but in general, uh, most of them are very low. And there's uh, a more typical of Higo Kashira. They have like this little carving in the middle, it's called Mountain Path. You can see it more uh, exaggerated on the, the ones to the right, which is also on the Kurigata, this little, what they call Mountain Path carving. And also typical for Higo Kashira is uh, a mix and match. You have one Fuji and a Kashira in a whole different style, which is not, you must not see as uh, someone made a mistake. No, it was all on purpose because you don't want to you don't want to if you follow the Wabi Sabi aesthetics You don't want to push it over the top. You don't want to have everything on, on suit One element has to be a little different because otherwise it would be it would be too much So you can see here there are Fuji can be covered in leather lacquered leather even can be uh, uh, Gold lacquered leather and a whole different style of, of Kashira. There's also one element that makes Higo Koshirai and those two types you have seen, the Kasen and the Nobunaga, those were copied over and over again for the whole rest of the Edo period. You can see here is another example, this time slight variation, you have not a lacquered same, it's just white same, but those were just within the, within the, the realms of, of, of still as a Higu Koshirai. So you have a little wiggle room of your personal style. It's another example. Here the whole scabbard is ripped, but it's still the ray skin scabbard and it's also a typical Hikotsuba. And there's another example. Same style, lacquered scabbard, uh, the same scabbard, white uh, same on the hilt, leather wrapping and the carved kashiro. And the funny thing is, those Higo Koshirai are mostly limited to katana lens. There are very, very few that are... Hoso Tadaoki did not pay so much attention to uh, his Tanto mountings because the elegant, <coughs> the elegant Koshigatana, we know, is the black scabbard and the white Same hilt without a hilt replicas were already pretty elegant enough. There was not that much for Hoso to refine, to have a Wabi Sabi Tanto mount. So this is one, a famous example that is said that was worn by Hoso Tadaoki during the hunt. Uh, it's named Waifuya Koshirai, the Waifuya, that was a, a merchant and it said that he had it before and Hosogawa Tadaoki got it from him but it's actually modeled after this, the Rikyu Koshirai, it's the Koshirai and the blade uh, with which uh, Saint Rikyu committed seppuku so Hosogawa Tadaoki had a, a Koshirai modeled after the one that Rikyu used when he committed seppuku so, with all that said, of course a very important part of Higo mountings are also the Higo fittings and first and foremost the Tsuba. So there are four main lines of, of Tsuba makers in Higo. The Tehayashi, the Hirata, the Shimizu and the Nishikaki. And the important thing is they were all supported by Kosokawa Tadaoki. He all sponsored them, he all ordered from them works. They were all under his patronage. And a little later on, the Kamiyoshi school came to, it was later in the uh, mid-Edo, right after mid-Edo, when the Hayashi school were not 
up to the game anymore and then the Hosokawa stepped in and said the Kamiyoshi family you are the guys you're gonna take over you have to preserve the, the, the Hayashi style but I don't want to go too much into Higutsuba today because it's a whole, tof a whole topic for itself so today main topic is just Higu Koshirai I just wanted to tell you about how the, the major makers were of the Hig Higu uh, Tsuba and fittings but there were also some collateral lineages on the ground working in, in Higu there were Nakane, Suwa, Tsubui, Toyama and so on uh, some of them only one master, some of them a couple of uh, a little workshop but there's also yeah there's also uh, this collateral lineages and there was a whole another different topic a different beast if you will uh, that's Edo Higo uh, which uh, I want to leave out for this uh, type this was Edo Higo is basically a style fittings maker in Edo made inspired by the Higo style then they were not in Higo down they didn't produce on the ground but that's why I want to leave them out but they, they followed the, they followed the basic Higo style so I just want to tell you show you a very like the uh, typical archetypical uh, works of each of these this major schools. The Hayashi school, you can see here two very famous works. Uh, the Hayashi, they were actually gun makers, so they were used to work with iron. That's what they focused on, um, top quality forged iron. That was their, their whole, their, their forte. And as you can see here, it's all, uh, it has the Wabi Sabi inspired theme again. It has very subtle, it has some broken weak tweaks, some, some, some broken branches, broken fans. It's all about impermanence and the imperfection of life. Then two more very typical for the Hayashi school. You can see here very <clears throat> high quality iron, very nice open work design and a little bit of gold accents. Not, not too much over the top here. And this is what the Kamiyoshi school later took over there. So they tried to recreate the original Hayashi style a little da later down in the Edo period. So the second of the major school was Hirata, Hirata Hikuso, as you can see here. He's more in soft metal, but he also made work in iron, of course. And it's, as you can see here, this concentric circles, it's yeah, like it aims at pottery. It aims at pottery, some here is even filled with cloisonne. One of my favorite uh, artists, Hirata Hikuso. Uh, then we have Shimizu Jinyu school coming out of the Hirata school. Their forte was iron plates with a brass inlay, an almost impressionistic brass inlay, very, <clears throat> very unique. You have not seen this anywhere nearly before the first Jinyu master. You can see it a little bit in some late Muromachi brass inlays. And also if you can see the look, uh, look at the Tsuba to the right, it almost looks like a naturally formed like molten iron. It follows the wabi-sabi style. As if, so he tried to produce a plate that looked like it could grow out of nature like a stone. He tried to recreate something naturally grown and aged. But of course it was all perfectly planned. And then in Nishikaki school, two very classically styled of them. Nishikaki worked both in iron and soft metal. And what you can also see here, Tsuba to the left, there are some counterparts made by the Akasaka school and other ones in Edo, but there's, uh, there's a difference. The Higo school is always a little bit more, a little bit more flimsily, more sophisticated. It's more like following more. Than, uh, it's not as bold as the Akasaka school did in Edo. It's a very striking, clear-cut design. Later on, of course, there's some overlap. And then the very typical work of Nakane Heihachiro. He was producing this tsuba that was on the on the Nobunaga model after after the famous Nobunaga Koshira, and we have someone on the table over there. That's his typical style. He had this little like Greek style key style pattern around and around the rim. That's what he became famous for. And then just some some other uh, of the collateral makers, but they all st stayed within the the typical Hebrew style: iron and a little bit gold, not too much. Then there's also uh, the Misumi school, there's a very difficult to grasp. There's not even consensus if it was one maker or several, mm -hmm. but he had very esoteric uh, animals and, and, and like toads and, and, and Minuki, that was, the, that was the style of the Misumi school. And then also what, what, what counts as a, a Higoko Shirai, 
but we should, it's not a classical Higo Koshirai, it's just because it's from Higo, it's the Musashi Koshirai. So we all have seen the, the classical Musashi Tsuba, what they call, you know, C cucumber, left and right opening. That's the one actually worn by Ms. Musashi and then handed down with his family. Uh, was also later copied over and over again. So it also comes under the category of the Higo Tsuba because when Musashi was 45 or 46 years old, after being a Ronin for so long, he entered the service of Hosokawa, of the Hosokawa family, moved down to Kumamoto, <coughs> where he spent the next last 20 years of his life writing about his swordsmanship down there. And another typical Musashi Tsuba, but he also made some, some soft metal, uh, very rough and rustic looking, that has uh, the draws from swordsmanship and Zen philosophy. So you have here the catfish and the gourd, and the concept behind is this, that the, the gourd is so uh, like slippy and you put the gourd underwater, like you try to keep it underwater with, with something slippery like a catfish. The, the gourd always tries to escape. It's like a swordsmanship. You, can, you can't be still, it's all very fluid. There's a whole concept behind that that has to be this, uh, a different topic for that. And Miyamoto Masashi also made fittings. He also made menuki and all kind of sword fittings, but it's very difficult because he didn't sign his works. And most of them, they were just handed down as his works. So we're not sure where a lot of those, if it really goes back to his hand. So, and then there's another subtype of, of the Musashi Koshirai, which is called Niten Koshirai. And it goes back to his uh, favorite style, the Niten Ichiryu of swordsmanship. And he, he came up, or not he came up, he, he liked this Kashira where you can strike people, you know. You, can, you don't draw the sword, but you're going to strike someone on the forehead, so just with the Kashira. Mm -hmm. So it's like a subtype. Can be classified as Higu Koshira, if you will, because it comes from down there. And that's, a, and that's what I mm -hmm. wanted to come back before we just uh, wrap it up. Again, what makes a Higu Koshira, Higu fittings, and going back to archetypes that were designed by, by Hosokawa Tadeoki. And so please take a look, we have some very fine uh, uh, objects over there on the table, and you will see those elements and in each and every Koshirai. So please take a look, they are different within a certain uh, level, like within certain parameters, but they're all Hiku Koshirai. And that's why I wanna close it here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. mm -hmm. it's, it's not, not really a question, but a <coughs> comment that I think would add something to your conversation about mis, uh, misumi. Mm -hmm. um, I heard that one one way you can tell I a pair of minikis are by him is that he never made uh, any mythological creatures. Mm -hmm. It's always like living animals, but. Right. Like tadpoles or, yeah. or catfish or something. Turtles. You turtles, turtles or, or yeah. in the case of the example you gave there, um, mm -hmm. um, seahorses. Right. They were always like living animals right. and never like no, mythological. He yeah, he didn't make any kirin yeah. or, or dragons right. or anything. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's also interesting that his name Mizumi actually means triangle in Japan. Yeah. And if you turn it around, some of his pins on the Minuki are actually triangular, so that's a kante point. There are some, there are some chisel marks that are supposedly triangular, but they're very difficult to find. And those are so rare, you hardly have a chance like, to study them hands-on. And so someone has to point you out, that's a Mizumi, a Mizumi punch mark, which I am not aware of either, because it's very obscure. He's a very elusive maker, there's not much, there is a, like there's the Higo Kinku Roku that was written in the late Edo periods where they wrapped up all their artists and there's like one chapter on him and that's about all we know about the, the Mizumi makers. Thank you, Marcus. Sure. Yeah.